everyone. Welcome to Beacons of Balance. I'm Arlene, Linda, and this is our guest speaker, Cynthia Smith. And we're here, we're going to continue on this month's topic of near-death experience. I want to welcome everyone here. Thank you so much for taking time. We're so grateful that you're taking time out of your day to either hear us, listen, or listen in here and <laughs> see us all at the same time. So we're going to go on with um, continuing this month's topic, which is NDE, which is near-death experience. Of course, there's OB, which is out-of-body experience. And okay, welcome everyone. And here we go. So Lin Linda. Welcome. So I'm going to intro you, Cynthia. By the way, she's in heaven because you can tell with the sparkly behind Yeah, she's, she's not here. She's in another dimension. She's in another <laughs> dimension. So Cynthia was part of Dr. Kenneth Ring's IAND group in Connecticut. Dr. Ring was one of the founding fathers of NDEs. 42 years ago, Cynthia's brother was in a serious car accident the night of her high school graduation and was in a coma for four days. 11 days later, Cynthia was in one of six passengers in a fatal car crash in Palm Springs, California. She was in a coma for over two weeks, told she would never walk again. And now here's Cynthia's story. Yeah. 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 Your poor parents. Your poor parents. Yeah. Your for poor sure. Parents. You know. I, How did I your mean, brother do? By the way, he is he still with us? Fine. I mean, he has. You know, he has some residuals because okay. he it had a little brain. It's never interfered with ha a happy, healthy life. So I oh, never. I never asked. Did your brother have an experience? No. When he no. Okay. That he, he can't recall. Okay. Yeah. No, he never did. Mm -hmm. And. uh Later, my dad got cancer and he died on the table of surgery and they brought him back to life. And he was so angry. He's like, how come I didn't have a near death experience? I wanted to, you know, why didn't God show up for me? And, you know, I don't think it works that way. Well, we I talk mean, about that, that some people, when they come back, there's a lot of the, um, it, the emotional stuff that goes around it, that they become depressed. Um, they want to commit suit. They don't want to stay here because they know yeah. what the other part is. and. Um, you know. And with my experience, I never really had that. I had my experience. Um, I was I was in the light, and then I was brought back, and I didn't get a choice or a decision. It, it just was what it was. I mean, I knew when I was in the light that I was alive, that I had a decision I could make, that right. I had a life to lead, and so it. I don't remember like coming back into my body or anything like. That. Right. It just ended. So um, I, w I was in a terrible car accident. So my brother had his car accident. He got out of the hospital. He walked me out. Or he walked. He literally was in a robe when I got into this truck that ended up in an accident. Um, and he was very serious with me. You know, I got him like this for the sun night. Whew, blinding me. Um, he said, uh, that's funny, blinding me. Um, so he, he was like, be careful, be careful. And got into this car. We were all drinking and driving. I mean, I could have been driving that car, right? Um, and I used to blame the driver. You know, initially I was like, "This happened because of drunk." I was drinking right next to him. Why did, did I? You, did you hit um, another car or what happened? He went off the side of the road and I'm rolled. sorry, what? He went off the side of the road. Oh, okay. So uh, drinking and driving on one side and because we were pulling a uh, Baja bug behind us so there was um something that made us like skid on the highway and then we rolled to the right and um there was six of us and um one person was killed um decapitated from the back from the yeah from the um when we were rolling she flew out of the back and we were Basically, she got ran over by the Baja bug and was literally decapitated. Could you explain that you had you had you had told me you stopped and you were sitting where the, where that girl was sitting is where you actually were sitting. Yeah, well, he had just traded spots, so they traded. That was, yeah, because you got out to go to the bathroom. Yeah, we got out. To, we pulled over to go to the bathroom, which we did. And our way back, we decided that we were going to switch off in the middle I was in the back with two other people and so she got in the back and I got in the front and um I don't remember any of it 
I woke up in the hospital after being unconscious like two weeks or long. It was a while before I have any recollection of anything. And then um, I woke up to a friend that I went to high school with who um, I never talked to after this. This is That's the weirdest part because we used to hang around all together. So she, I was in a part away from where I lived. Um, so anybody who came to visit me had to drive like an hour, hour and a half at least. And so they, she came to see me. I was in intensive care. I th- This is the first... I have of being in the hospital. And I woke up to her like, oh, oh my God, like hysterical crying. Oh my God, oh my God, are you okay? Are you okay? And it was so weird for me. I was like, what what is what's wrong with you know, like it was like a what? What she's panicking. Why is she panicking? And it was because um of this accident. I guess I looked really bad. Anyways, long story short down. She only was allowed to see me for five minutes. Um, and at that point there had been somebody with me all the time. So they would be telling people coming in, don't mention this. Don't talk about that. Blah, blah, blah. So she came in and started crying. Told her don't mention the car accident, right? Or don't mention Linda being deceased. Cause I asked about everyone, but Linda. So they thought I, I wasn't ready to hear that she had passed. Well, she said to me, are, is everything, you know, I, I was telling her, I'm okay, I'm okay. But all along, I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm in this hospital. Like, this is where my brother was the last I remember, right? And there's curtains around me and I could hear the noises and I, arms and they were so weak and I couldn't really lift them very well. And I was in traction and I was being pulled and, you know, so all this stuff was going on in my head. Like, what is happening here? And she said, well, how's everyone? She was I, I don't, I, I wasn't aware what it looked like. You know, I was a scab, like this much of my hair was gone because I, I went through the desert floor and my whole head, you know, I had braces, thank God, or I wouldn't have any teeth. I had like all kinds of um, scabs, not scabs, <laughs> scars in my mouth from my braces. So I went really, really far um, in the desert floor and up and over a rock. My friend Kelly, who was alert, them was running around looking for me um and they thought they were she was looking for linda so they were holding on to her because they knew linda had been decapitated right these these people who pulled over to help us and looking for me because i was so far from the scene of the accident from rolling seven or eight times in the car i got stuck in the car and that's where i broke my neck my back my leg my pelvic so i wake up in the so imagine what my friend is looking at, like, you know, one giant scab, intensive care. She's crying. And I'm like, what the heck? And um, what's going on here? And so she in the paper, Linda was killed. And I woke up. That's when I really like woke up. What? And she said, well, I got to go. My five minutes is up. And she left. So I think she knew she was bringing tension that I wasn't aware of. I called the ho- the hospital nurse and she came in and I knew her name it was Judy. It was the same name as my mom's, which, and I was like, Judy, what happened to me? And she said, I'll be right back. And I, knew and she left. And then my brother and my, and one of the girls in the car accident who had been at the hospital there, they were in the cafeteria when all this took place, came back and walked in. Both of them were crying. So I knew immediately was killed. That's when I, and I kind of panicked a little bit. I went into shock and I was saying, you know, what happened to me? What happened to me? My brother was, don't move, don't move. You broke your neck. You broke your back. You know, you, Cynthia, you're in trouble. You know, don't move. You know, I was trying so hard and it, it was a very sad time. And I, for the first time in my life, cause I never went to church really my whole life. And I didn't, you know, um, to my father, right? So we never went to church and we were never raised in a, in a biblical fashion of any sort. And um, I said to them, I said, I need, I need time. Can you guys give me some time? Which they didn't want to do. They didn't want to leave. No, no, we're here for you. But no, I just need a minute. And they left. And I said in my head, I don't know, I might've said it out loud, is I need you, God. 
And the most extraordinary thing happened to me. I had, I was like in blackness, it was all dark. And then there was this light really far away, really far away in my stomach, real far back. It was a part of me in this light. And it was dark, but it started coming closer and closer and closer. And then it, boom, it was all around me. I was in. And there was just the most peaceful, loving, comfortable, safe. I mean, you can't put it into words. It's impossible. I, I, I feel like it's a joke. So I'm in this beautiful light that I knew was God. It had to have been. It was, it was God. There was like, it wasn't even that I knew or questioned it or thought about it. It just, if that makes sense. And, um, I saw up to the left of me, this huge, like I would, I would say that it would be like the size of a redwood tree. Uh, Jesus, Jesus was there and he was floating and he had his arms open and his arms were flowing with light. Like it was like, it was so beautiful. And, but it was clearly his face, clearly Jesus Christ. And I just had all this telepathic information. And like, I knew everything that ever would be. And I had perfect calm stillness that I knew everything was perfect just the way it was supposed to be. And I had like this, this knowledge that I'd never had before. I can't pinpoint it today. It is, but every now and then something will come up in my life and I go, oh, that was it. That was it. That was part of it. You know, um, like the book. I don't know if you guys have heard of the book conversations with God. Yeah. <laughs> I used to sell it at the store. <laughs> yeah. it's, that was my experience. What yeah. that is very much the clear message I received from Jesus. That you felt vibration in your soul energy. Yeah. And also there's another book out that I don't remember the name of it. Something paradigm, change your paradigm. It is kind of like the secret, but just slightly different. Yeah. Um, I don't really secret, but conversations with God and um, change your paradigm is two books that it's like that was the that's everything I knew so while I was in the near-death experience I had this perfect knowing and I I said what what happened to me what am I to do with this and I didn't say it I mean it's just like it was messaged back and forth and anything you want you have at your fingertips any day any time forever and ever yeah you know I've I've Give it, I, that is your gift, basically. Words. And I said, well, if I walk with a cane, I'll be happy. And I think I chose a disability because I felt that it would make the most impact in the world. Rather that it would be and like my purpose, like in the world with a disability and a smile on my face, <laughs> you know? And so I chose it. And I I, I remember the words too. Not exactly like if I, I said, if I walk with the cane, I'll be happy. It'll be it. It's your choice. And by the way, he told me at the time, you can heal your yourself anytime you want. Wow. Anytime. Yeah. You can heal yourself anytime you want. And it doesn't matter if you, it's like this or if you're, you know, on earth, it's at your disposal. It's and then I had. Yeah. It's almost like that saying where Christ, when he said, Lazarus rise from the dead. So he was basically telling you that, right? Yeah, I, I didn't know any of that. Do you, right. I mean, the thing is, I didn't know anything. I knew everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it. And um, when, I, when I came out of that experience, um, I knew. And so back, back while I was in the light before, I don't want to just shut that that whole, like minimize that because that's the most profound experience I've ever had in my entire life and will remain the most profound experience I've ever had in my life because there's nothing that could touch that. Nothing. And yeah. So, so life changing. 
And um, so also in the light, these like spirits, there was a lot of spirits around, you know, greeting me. So good to see you. But they were no different. Like one wasn't like, oh, grandma, I can't. I'm so glad to be here. There was no differential between love. It didn't matter. It wasn't like it could have been my dad. It would have still, I still would have been loved and adored in the same way that I loved them. Would not have had a different level. And so there were spirits around me, greeting me, loving me, and four of them were connected. I mean, like literally surrounding me and connecting me. And um, and and somebody and I stole it from him, so it's not mine, but it it does it does sum up what the soul is like in heaven. And he said it's like a bottle of water, you know, the clear bottle, and inside there's water. Saw, you could see the formations and and the, also the light of them was vibrating, but it wasn't vibrating. It was kind of like motion of water. Like a lava lamp? No. No. Pulsa- pulsating? No. No. Just like. A wave? Like waving? Movement. Movement, yeah. It was just energy, energy. That's the best I could um, put it. And so there were many of those, and it, they were almost, they weren't in the form of a cross, but they were like a cross, kind of. I, I don't know, you guys. It didn't matter, but <laughs> they were souls. It was souls. And uh, I, I knew come back and I didn't I didn't say I'm going back now bye nothing like that I just woke up in the hospital room and and there was more to that experience too right but it, it all, all in all it changed significantly well you said but can we go back because I know a little bit about your story um when you were in that experience you said there were the entities that were close to you and you knew without I, I, knowing but you knew who they were yeah. Right. And oh, I know that two of that two of those were my kids for sure. I have but twin at the boys. time you didn't know. You know, Did I gotta you know tell that? you. Um, no. Yeah. But here's the thing that, you know, happened to me after that experience when I was in the hospital that were miraculous. Miraculous. Like even my doctors were like, I don't understand this. This wow. So they had me in traction on my neck and they had me in traction on my leg my femur. And so I had to have, I had to have my back stabilized. Um, I had to have back surgery. Then I had to have my back stabilized. Then I had to have my neck stabilized. I had one of those things. that They put the halo. halo. I was literally an angel. You had the Um, halo. Yeah. By the way, horrible. So I had a halo for six months. Oh Um, God. It was all a process, right? But um, it took six weeks from the day of my accident to the day on my left femur. And because I was in traction, my leg was an inch and a half apart, the bones. Well, the bones healed, which they could not make sense of because it was a complete break. And that bone is the biggest. Sometimes it never heals. And it had healed completely. So rather than them, you know, clean out the the bone marrow and put it together so it's the right length, they left it and they put a plate in it. So I had to go back and have it rebroken two years later. Whoa. Yeah, that, yeah, that was great. Um, really fun. <laughs> but um, yeah, that sucked. But you didn't um, ask God for that one. <laughs> no. But so the weird thing is these weird, there's these weird things that happen. So when I went in from my surgery on my leg, they were like, what? They had no idea that that would have been healed. So my leg had healed, which the doctor thought. Remarkable, miraculous, right? He could not make sense of that. Um, then another thing is like I had my car accident, my near death on July 2nd in 1982. That was when I was 18, right after I graduated. And before on the same day, July 2nd, I gave birth to twins. So I never wanted to have kids. And yes, I never wanted to have children. I got pregnant with my first husband. 
and I was pregnant with and because they run in my family. Um, and miraculously it worked out the way it did. But to me, when I was in the hospital, oh gosh, guys, I wish I had the time to tell you. So my car accident, yeah, there's so many miraculous so many things that happen that we're just like, whoa, what is this? I mean, so clearly I am here. I am here. I'm here. I'm never, you're never without me. And, you know, wake up because I was so young and so uh, guarded, especially because I didn't want to be religious and I didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to be weird. I didn't want people to think I was making this stuff up or on drugs. I didn't tell a lot of people because weird situation. But yeah, so my mom and dad lived in Huntington Beach when I had my car accident. Um, And the car accident was four hours away from my house. Okay. So I ended up at Ford Clinic um, for Betty Ford Clinic. (laughs) That's not where I was. Betty Ford Clinic (laughs) is Eisenhower Hospital (laughs) in Palm Springs. And Eisenhower Hospital is where I did my first three hospitalization and stabilization. And then they sent me via helicopter to a spinal cord sur- a spinal cord um, rehabilitation hospital in Fullerton, California. But Fullerton, California, a 45 minute drive from where my parents lived. So in order for them to come and visit me in the hospital, it was, you know, a big deal, right? Um, fast forward 12 years later, when I got pregnant, I ended up going to my parents' house and and looking up one of my doctors in Fullerton um, to see if I could, you know, I wanted to check out, am I okay here? Can I carry these babies? Um, My parents had moved from Huntington Beach to Anaheim Hills. Well, now their local hospital is the same hospital I ended up in for spinal cord rehab surgery 12 years later, just by fluke. On July 2nd, 1994, uh, when my kids are born, I wake up from having this baby. First of all, after I had my C-section, I woke up in the in my room. I was alone. Linda, the girl who was killed in my car accident, was behind me. I knew she was there. I knew she was looking after me. Yeah, I just was like, and I was trying to look at her because I could see, I knew she was there with me. And she woke me up. That was a really weird thing after I had the babies. But then that night I'm laying in my bed and the fireworks are going off. And I'm like, how weird is this? 12 years later, I happen to be in the same home, giving birth to twins born on the same day as my car accident after like just really crazy stuff happened um, that just kept pointing in the direction of a lot more bigger things in life and us. Right. Yeah. So but you, you knew the twins were those spirits that when you had that experience, that that's who they were. And you, and Linda was there too, right? She was one of the other spirits with you. Uh, looked out for me for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She was around me. Yeah. I, I don't get that sense anymore, though. That kind of changed, I think, uh, when my parents passed away. I, I don't mm-hmm. know if they passed the torch or if they're all guardian angel. I don't know. Um, well, they, they can't change things, but they're vibrationally always there. I can never tap into my parents and I'm a psychic medium and, and I can't, I can read everybody else's deceased, but I can't read my own. So why not? Why is that? Mine came came to me in dreams. Uh Not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a few dreams, little dreams. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I had a dream once too. That was really like it, you know, wake up. Yeah, that. profound. Well, somebody was knocking at my. That was not a dream, right? I had that once, and um, but really miss my parents. I wish. Yeah. Um, but also here's something that they did for me. Check this out. So fast forward. Do you guys want me to stick to my near death experience or should I? No, tell us about your parents. Okay. Okay. So, um, they both passed away. I bought the house from the estate. I moved to California in 2015. I'm living in their house. They both died of small cell undetectable lung cancer. But, um, 
So I'm in their home knowing that the small cell undetectable lung cancer, they lived on this hill down below a highway. So it had a view of Orange County. It's a beautiful house, full of them. But I knew that there was a reason why they passed away of cancer. And so I was driving home from my work one day and I was just kept getting this sense I shouldn't be in that house. I shouldn't be in that house. You know, like maybe there's some kind of, you know, rock. What's that gas that comes out of rock? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, stuff like that. And I'm like, so I, I just put it out there. And I said, you know, mom and dad, I talked out loud. If you guys are here, if you want me out of that house, it is obvious to me that I will not doubt for one second that I shouldn't be in that house. And I'm going to leave this to you. I have faith in this, blah, blah, blah. I get home and I'm thinking, I got to move out of this house. It's this house. It's this house. Mine, whose husband was a real estate agent. I said, you know, what's the market like? And he said, I'll send you some comparables. So he sends me some comparables. And I'm like, you know, I think I want to put the house on the market and get out of here. And he goes, okay. Know, we talked about it and blah, blah, blah. Anyways, the next day he calls me. The next day he calls me and says, there's a person who just put an offer on a house. It's exactly like yours in that neighborhood, but it doesn't have the. And they would like to come and look at your house before they finalize this sell. And I said, I'm not ready to sell this house. He said, he said well, they just want to look. So I said, oh, all right. So they came over and looked at the house, which is, you know. I got a phone call an hour later and they would like to buy your house for X amount of money. If you leave within 30 days. Wow. There's your sign. Oh, did you ever find out what was wrong with the house? No, I didn't. I did not. You, th- Never. you thought it was like radon. Well, it so is kind of- radon or because they lived below, you know, there was a highway pretty yeah. prominent down here that the air maybe came up yeah. when my dad was a jogger he jogged every day he was very fit yeah it could have been part of that i don't know but i just got this sense it's the house yeah. house and it was the next day there was no denying that okay yeah. i was you're with me <laughs> you got yeah. me okay thank you i'm in and so and i and i had them with me very strongly for many years and i don't so much anymore well, they ascend. I had a girlfriend that died of leukemia at 17. I used to know where her grave site was. I, sometimes I couldn't find it. I'd yell for her and she'd say, I'm over here. And I'd go over and visit her. And then I had a 100-year-old friend die. And I went to the funeral service, which is in the same graveyard. And I thought, while I'm here, I'll stop off and see Terry. Might as well. And I went over to the spot that I remembered that she used to be. And I'm looking, I couldn't find her. So I yelled out for her and she didn't answer me. And I yelled out again. And a man said, as clear as day, she has ascended. So I thought, because she was sort of a saint on earth, even though she, you know, she only died at 17. So then I called the mortuary and asked where her grave was located. And I found her and there was a new grave right next to her. And it was her father. Oh, uh, he was the but, one that told me she has ascended, but she's ascended. So sometimes, you know, depending on who they were in this world, sometimes they ascend pretty quickly. You know, it's funny you should say that because when my dad died, my dad got cancer. That was so shocking to us because he was the of all of us, all the grandkids, you name it. My dad was serious about his health. and. Yeah him to get this cancer and die it was such a shock and I was in so much I was grieving so heavily that he passed away I couldn't grieve anymore if that makes sense I couldn't Whoa. be sadder than I already was and when she passed I kissed her on the cheek I kissed in fact both of them I was I like my dad passed away my mom was, I think your dad passed away and I went over and closed his eyes and his mouth because he fell he died in his sleep and then and I said, whispered to him, go find the light, dad, look for the light. And then when my mom passed, another wild story, but I won't get into it. She passed away and I immediately, I whispered, mom, go find the light. And I had in my head, I could see, I couldn't see it. It was in my head of my parents, like just, 
just dancing together and boom, off they boom, went. Off and into I, paradise. And I firmly believe he was not going anywhere without her. Yeah. You know, they were married for 50 some odd years and they were madly in love. And I'm so glad that she went because she didn't belong with me. So no. Long. So. But um, how old were they when they died? I was 72 and she was 70. They were still young. Yeah. Young. I mean, and healthy and in love and active. Great people. And how long was the period between uh, mother and father uh, that they passed? August 21st, 2011. My mother died on January 1st, 2012. So, oh, wow. not so yeah, it was close. Yeah. It was. Did your mom say if he came to visit her? No, oh, I never, I, we never talked about that. I never asked her stuff like that. I didn't say, mom, it, you know, my, it, she had brain cancer. So she oh. had it in her lungs, but it went to her brain. Oh yeah. That's nasty. But she didn't have. I mean, we're really blessed. It wasn't a brain cancer death like they you have. She didn't have any seizures. She didn't, you know, um, she, but she did hold on for a week to see her sister who never showed up. Sister came and said, she's not coming. My mom took her last breath and died right there. Wow. She did, held you on share, did you share your ND with your parents? Did they know? Everybody. <laughs> Yes. You know, we just had um, a doctor on that. She held it for a number of years because she just thought, you know, people think, you know, as you know, Cynthia, people think you're crazy or something like that. But now, how did this, let me ask you something, because we, we went across, we, we highlighted things that people go through when they come back after an ND. You know, a lot of people go through a severe depression. Sometimes people want to just commit suicide. They don't want to connect anymore with society. It um, affects their relationships, as I'm sure you know, because you used to be part of the IANS group and people would end up getting divorces because the other partner couldn't handle the change in them. Um, did you go through any of that? I never had that. No. Because I knew that I, my life was, I was meant to live live if that makes sense i wasn't meant to just exist i was meant interfere to with your relationship um with your, well, your it, at the time it, it was hard for me to assimilate who love really was in in everyday life i still find it hard difficult to like i feel like alone in my knowledge, I think there was a light that shined in me that most people don't have. And that was called the light of God, a light, a light, a desire, a, you know, hope and happiness and joy that I don't naturally have. We all have it in us. But the thing is, they say when we come in here, you know, we're escorted in by our angel. And this is why we have, see under our nose. On top of our top lip, we have that indentation. It's where they put their finger and they go, shh. In other words, we come in, we have all the knowledge because we're coming, right, from there. But then it's like taken away from us. <laughs> and that's what this indentation is. It's like, shh, you don't talk. I say a lot of us are, everybody's sleepwalking, like people aren't awake. So what's happening now is, you know, people are waking up now and becoming yeah. aware. More, more aware. I, I, it's How's your to... pain with your pain with your neck and your uh, hip and everything? I never had pain in my neck. Really, no oh, arthritic. I have arthritis. I have arthritis in and in my back. Yeah, oh, okay. I have to have shots, but I'm I'm working on my paradigm. My I'm going to shift my unconscious. I'm going to start doing something I've never done before. It's going to be a very um, intense self reflection on the spirit inside the god inside of us so ever since my near-death experience and coming out of it you know when you're telling somebody like i i didn't tell just anybody by the way many many people i i was probably married with my husband for my first husband i i don't know how long we were together before i told him about my near-death experience um uh, but when i first had it and i came out I'm in the hospital and people are like, oh my talks in the hospitals. Like they knew there were twins in the hospital when I had twins, you know, stuff like that. And uh, they would come to me with their Bible 
and they'd read me verses. And I knew exactly what they were reading. I knew the verses. I understood the story. And I never had a formal, any education on religion at all. Me too. My parents were atheists. Yeah. And I woke up saying the Lord's Prayer, fighting a demon. And in consciousness, regular consciousness, I didn't know the Lord's Prayer. But in the in the dream, fighting the demon, I knew it. How would you? Oh, gosh, I want to hear your story. I wrote How a book <laughs> about it. It's coming out in March. Oh, is it? Yeah. I'll definitely get it. We'll um, get your address. I'll send you a copy. I'd love one. That sure. would be awesome. So you you know what I'm talking about. For people who have near-death experiences, it's hard to put these things in. It's hard to uh, express the depth of beauty and love. It's like... Well, as a medium, I tell people, if I could bottle up what your loved one is feeling over there, if I could bottle it up and pour it on you, you would not mourn another day, not another second, because it's... It's paradise. And and those of us who have been touched are know what, what's over there. And it, it's like you want to announce everybody, look, it's right there. You can grab it. But people choose to suffer. It's really weird. And like they always say to me, Linda, life is for the living. Get out of your own way and move forward and know that we're always with you. I'm so glad you said that because that's something I, after my parents died, I, I got so depressed. I, I was in, I, I never, okay. I have never, I will never experience and the impact it made on me. Never. Okay. Cause it was huge, life changing. But when my parents died and especially the way it happened and went about, I lost touch. I stopped praying. I stopped connecting. I couldn't go there. And it wasn't because I didn't know, I didn't believe in God. I always will always believe in God. I always believe in the light, but I couldn't, I I think I was just in such deep grief. I, the two just didn't meet. But don't beat yourself up about it. Cause they told me too. Sometimes when I'm trying to tell someone, oh, you know, your loved one, they say, allow them the grief. You have to go through grief. But there was a woman that I had read that she had a husband of 17 years that treated her horrible. And she finally left him. She escaped thinking that there was nobody out there for her. She meets a beautiful man. He's fantastic. Seven months, she had nothing but joy, joy, joy. It was like a dream come true. And then he died in his sleep. So she was mourning and crying. And she said, Linda, I just couldn't function. And one day I heard an angel say to me, are you crying because he's gone? Or are you crying because he's alive and you're not? So they're more in the hot collective consciousness on the other side. And they look at us, they're sorry we feel that way. Yeah. But they're also kind of like, yeah, you're but if you knew where I was, you wouldn't grieve. Right. I totally, totally believe that. I I feel like, you know, so making sense, being 18, having an experience like this and trying to make sense of that in my life was... Oh, and being disabled, not being able to walk. I mean, I didn't walk for three years. I was having surgery. Yeah. And I, and but I knew I was going to walk. I knew it. And that's something. That's remarkable. I mean, you're walking and then, and then you're married and you have children and you have twins. I mean, that's that's an incredible, incredible story. It was God knocking there, on my door. You know, there's a reason for all of this. There's a reason yeah, for it. We, we don't get it. But I mean, my first message that I got was the key to unlock all the mysteries is love. It's one simple word. It's about love. We do everything from that source and that source is love. And um, I mean, I think we could all reflect on our own personal agendas and stuff that we go through every day. Whatever we do, whatever actions we take, if it's not coming from that place and that that light, it's like it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It falls apart. Something, ha- you know what I mean? But if you just give it the freedom, the, the the light to it, it just flourishes. It's hard. It's hard, especially with people with rough lives that probably never had unconditional love. Because that's yeah. unconditional love over there. And oh, yeah. that's why a lot of them will go over. They don't want to come back. They're in manna in heaven. But um, the, the grief and that feeling alone is very, very strong. And and my guides are always telling people, hey, you're never by yourself. You're always, we're always with you. So 
There's some mm -hmm. comfort. And if you don't feel it, if you're not understanding it, or you still feel those despondent feelings, hand it over. You don't have to take this on. Tell them, help me to help myself, and then wait for it. Don't overthink things because you cause what they, uh, uh, you know, you go into a state of resistance. Just yeah. say, help me help myself, and then allow, and then and I, wait for what happens. And I always say, Linda, that's the form of prayer also, because we put things out there, but then we end up taking it back. Taking it back, yeah. You know what I mean? When we take it back, we don't allow them, or we give mixed messages. Yes, you know, yes. We give mixed messages. You, My husband's going through this right now because, um, you know, he wants to retire, kind of, so to sell the business, but then he doesn't. Do you know what I'm saying? So I said to him the other day, I said, you're like a rubber band. It's going back and forth. I go, yes, I want to, but no, I don't. So I said, how's that going to, how's that going to manifest if you're doing it that way? <laughs> it doesn't happen. Thing I'm talking about. Yeah. Change. It's really about how we get stuck in our habits and we're unconsciously failing because we're not changing our habit formation and our yeah. thoughts. Instead of moving past the, I can't do this. I have a disability. I can't, right? Oh, I'm not good enough for that. I have, you know, you have to change the habit of what you're talking because that's what, why we create pattern. Exactly. Well, they yeah. say, what's, what's insanity doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Yeah. You have to, um, you have to change it. You kind of have to get outside the box. So anyway, so. How could you wrap it up as far as what you walked away with from this experience as far as, because this is about balance. So how would it, uh, from where you were in balancing it out? I balance my day to day. I'm human. Ultimately, God's put me here to learn some things. I've got some things, you know, figure out what my purpose is. And so I balance my life out by trying to love and be loved. And that's why my job is perfect for me. Um, and um be a I, I like to be a conduit like I'll, i will talk about my experience regardless of what somebody else may think how crazy i was or drug infested i was or whatever i speak about this because i have and some people can't speak about near-death experiences and i will be the voice because it, it needs to be known that there is a loving 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 god and right yeah well that's what this is all about that's what this channel is all about because as you said we don't have a voice if people don't want to talk about things they keep it they still keep it to their to their chest they don't talk about it. and that's that's the era that i grew up in you know we didn't talk yeah, about people. you don't me too with we my didn't father. talk about anything i tell the story that yeah. you know my father i remember my father telling and i was a kid he said we're democrats he said and don't you tell anybody I didn't know what the hell a Democrat was. I thought we were in the, I thought we were in the mafia. I didn't know. <laughs> I never knew what it was. They never explained anything. Exactly. But exactly. It was, it was cray cray. Crazy. <laughs> oh, well. So, Cynthia, thank you for taking thank time you, out of your day and you're beautiful and you're just going to continue on. And, and Linda, you're a light Cynthia, worker. Cynthia wants to start like, um, a business with um, taking challenged individuals, right? With challenges on traveling. and I, I started, travel. invented a television series called The Freedom to Travel. And it's where somebody with a disability goes somewhere in the world. So you're interviewing them and their disability, but you're taking them to an uh, so that anybody else, the general society is reducing their stigma. Uh, learning more about people with disabilities and also being able to go on a vacation if you wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, wonderful. So we're putting it out there, you it's know, sent out. Yeah. That's where my real heart lies. And that's there kind of, yeah. thank you so, for taking time to be with us. And as, al as always, Linda, what do you want to say? But I want to say, be the change you want to see, be the change you want to see. And from our hearts to your hearts, always in love peace, joy, balance. Everybody, thank you for watching, seeing, and listening. And we love you guys. We're growing. And please subscribe. Keep us going. And we'll see Keep you the next going. time. <laughs> Keep it going. See you the next time. Bye, honey. Love you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.